concept to me of being a motivational speaker, I prefer to be known as a motivational trainer. You're going to be learning some tips, tools, and strategies that you could implement the second you walk out of here. I want to make this different. I want to make it interactive so you guys are learning. The only reason I'm up here today is to do everything I can to help you be better. I don't give fluff. I don't give generic template stuff. I don't do that. When you're in business for yourself, the secret sauce is you. Why do you do what you do? You stand out by being yourself and being human. That's your job, is to capture people's attention with engaging stories. The number one entrepreneurial quality is a willingness to embrace struggle. Use fear of failure as fuel to be better. What's the next motivator? What's the next carrot dangling? What's your why? So this is emotional intelligence at its best, right? So this is what I do. I have one technique I use, and I call it fooling myself. So this is what I'll do. When you start getting that feedback that could trigger you and make you defensive, I actually already have it ready to say, so I distract myself, I'll say, you know what, thank you, that was really helpful, it'll help me be a better learner, or help me be a better whatever. That's what I'm ready to say, so I almost, I'm still active listening, I wanna hear what they have to say, but it distracts me from being triggered emotionally, and then I make a mental note of it, but it goes back to what I said about validation before, people wanna have a voice and be validated, so when you, you're giving them a chance to give feedback, and then by you acknowledging and by the way, validation doesn't mean agreement. When you validate someone's feedback, it doesn't mean you agree with them. It just means you're being empathetic and validating it. So that, to me, is very important in that moment. How much does it mean if you had, I don't care if it was Mike or anybody else, a manager, someone on a higher level than you at the bank, walks into your office and says, Kate, I got a problem. I would love to get your feedback on how to solve it. Do you not feel like a million bucks in that situation? Right? And frankly, the better example would be someone who does it when it's not even your department. Maybe, maybe it's not a, has nothing to do with marketing or sales. It could be an operational question. Now think about that for a second. Let's not pigeonhole people communication-wise. Kate, she's in marketing. Well, I would bet a lot of money she knows a heck of a lot more about life in professional business than marketing. But people probably don't ask her because that's your department, that's your know-how, that's your knowledge. So the point I'm trying to make is empower millennials, empower people that work for you, give them a voice, walk up to them. I tell parents when, with their kids, I tell parents, come home from work, go up to your eighth grade child and say, oh my God, I had the worst situation at work with my boss today. Um, here's what happened, what do you think I should have done? Like an eighth grader is going to be like, huh, you're asking me? Why not? I talk about hierarchy in our society because you start out with parents who tell you what to do. And then you go to school and you have teachers who tell you what to do. And then you get a job and you have bosses who tell you what to do. So you're always having people tell you what to do. So the idea here is one of the ways to remove the hierarchy of boss, manager to employee is to just, everybody's on the same level. So Instead of it being an interrogation and the manager is just asking all these questions to the employee, the, the bolded questions, I want the manager to share their answers too. All you need to do when you have to have a talk with someone that's either good or neutral is just say, hey, can we chat a few minutes or later today or tomorrow? I just want to pick your brain about a few things. Because pick your brain, you are going to be picking their brain. You're going to be asking them a whole bunch of questions and sharing some stuff. So when you say, can I pick your brain about a few things, they feel like their voice is being heard, you're empowering them to give feedback, okay? And then there's nothing wrong, you're just gonna pick their brain a few things, and then all they're thinking about is, and if they say, well, what do you wanna pick your brain about? You know what I'd say? I would say, actually, I've been studying, I've been, stu I've been studying recently information about motivation in the workplace, and I have some ideas, and I just wanna get your take on it. That's it. That's all you'd have to say. So you don't have to hide it. What is the typical first question when you are networking with someone? What do you do? That's what we all ask. What a snooze. Like, we all ask it, but why? 
that's not the most important thing to learn about something. That will come up in the course of conversation anyway, because Vanessa and Jeanette have told us that if you talk about what they suggested, it's going to lead to that anyway. The problem is, when we talk to people, we want to talk about what feels safe, which is our business, which is what we understand, which is what we're talking about all day. Stop worrying about feeling safe. Okay, start being a human, authentic, genuine person that's vulnerable enough to let people get to know you and form a relationship with you. We're always told to be memorable. I don't really care about being memorable. Because you know why? Because if I meet five of you tonight and I give you all my business cards and you get home and you're talking to someone and say, oh boy, saw this speaker tonight, he was great and so on and so forth. Well, that doesn't mean you're going to do anything with me or for me. It just means you remember me. So being memorable, that, that, that's, that's not really what you're after. Okay? How do you motivate people? And think about what Prudence is talking about. All of you in this room who know some or all of you, I'm sure you all want to help each other. Like, I'm sure there's no, there's no convincing of that. But Christy here, Christy gets home and she's really overwhelmed because she likes so many people in the group. She's like, where do I begin? I only have so much time. Because Christy has personal responsibilities. She has life responsibilities. And so to actually engage in trying to really go out of your way and help me get a job, that takes time. That takes genuine effort. So how do you motivate someone to put, how do you motivate Christy, Prudence, to say, Christy, I, I know you have so many people you could help, but you really should help me. Move in with them. <laughs> well, I mean, in, in, and I don't mean it in a selfish way, because I don't think anybody in here is selfish. That's not my point. But it is tough. There are only so many hours in the day. So part of what you're trying to do, Prudence brought up a great one, is how do you engage and motivate other people? There's three kinds of people in the world, right? There's the kids who are really good-hearted kids, kids that, you know, just have the know-how and wisdom to be kind and sweet to other kids, okay? Very small minority. They're out there, but they have it. Then there's the kids who are the complete opposite. They're just jerks. And a lot of these kids that are jerks, frankly, are probably jerks because of the role models they have at home, okay? Not an excuse, but a reality of the situation. Influences they have with friends, peer pressure, things like that, but they're jerks, okay? But the big group, this is the one I want to focus on tonight. The big group are the kids that don't know what to do. They, they don't understand these other kids. And when we don't understand other people, when we make assumptions about other people, we tend to say weird things. We tend to say odd things. And the example in this movie, in one of the opening scenes, one of the kids is given the kid with the facial deformations, his name is Augie, a tour of the school, and the kid looks at Augie and says, what kind of food do you eat? As if that would have anything to do with facial deformations. So the one to 10 technique is a method of asking the question, on a one to 10 scale, what is the willingness you'd be willing to do what I'm asking? All right? Now here is why this is a very effective technique. We'll test all your critical thinking right out of the gate. So if, if I said that and your son or daughter said four, few of you, what would that mean to you if they answered four? Not really much of a chance? Anybody else? It's almost halfway. Yeah. Okay, here's what a four means. The door's open. That's what the four means. If it's a two to a five, the door's open. Think about it. Because wouldn't they just say a one or a zero if there was no chance? Right? I'm challenging you all to go have a conversation with your children in the next few days that goes something like this. Hey, you know, I've been thinking. So I went to this parenting workshop the other night because I really want to be a better parent for you. And it occurred to me, if I was to ever have to talk to you about something, Tell me, what would be best? Like, where would you want to talk about it? When would you want to talk? What time of day? Is there a time where you Empower them. Just ask them the questions. Whoever does that? Because we, we know how we feel about it, but we're not asking our kids.